morning and welcome to Rising. We have an excellent show for you today. <laughs> Hello, Brianna. Hello, Robbie. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, so we're almost at the end of the week for us. Any any weekend plans? Uh, I'm just joining the search for Princess Kate. <laughs> <laughs> Where's Kate? <laughs> As all responsible citizens are, no? Are you doing something different? Do you uh, not care about the future of the I crown? <laughs> absolutely do. Um, no, I have a friend, a uh, uh, high school college buddy visiting me from out of town, so I'm excited for that. Probably going to play a lot of board games. Mm. Um, had a great Dungeons & Dragons session last night, mm. so I'm in, a, I'm in a good mood. What mm. can I say? A little bit of a sleepy mood. But a good one. <laughs> no, I actually we started really early, so I got to bed on time. That's very so responsible. I uh, so if my mental faculties aren't working, I, I can't blame um, sleeplessness. <laughs> it's just it's just me. <laughs> All right. Well, you might not be sleepy, Robbie, but sleepy Joel. Mm. Joe is having some problems. Polling suggests that Joe Biden has a big problem with uncommitted voters. Remember, the uncommitted movement is a push to encourage voters in the Democratic primary to vote uncommitted to convey their frustration with the president's handling of the Israel-Palestine conflict. As John Nichols covered in The Nation, Uncommitted now has won more than 370,000 votes in primaries and caucuses and will be going to the convention with at least 20 delegates. Now, in the Minnesota Democratic presidential primary last week, the uncommitted vote won 19 percent overall. Minnesota has a large Somali-American immigrant population and a significant Muslim community around the Twin Cities. But as Nichols points out, uncommitted also did well in white and Christian areas, picking up 20 percent in Duluth. Uncommitted also fared well in Hawaii's caucus on March 6, garnering 29% of the primary vote, and in North Carolina, where it picked up 12.7% of the vote on Super Tuesday. Mm. In Robson County in North Carolina, where 38% of voters are Native American, 22% are Black, and 10% are Hispanic, the uncommitted vote was 37%, which mm. might be a harbinger of things to come for Joe Biden as you look at the percent of his base that is a member of these groups that tend to be disproportionately registering their frustration specifically over Gaza. Yeah, um, you know, obviously it's this is a protest vote. This is to signal dissatisfaction with the choices Joe Biden is making. Um, you know, I'm sure his team is reassuring him as we speak that, oh, you know, these are just unhappy activist type people and, you know, well, you're going to be the nominee and they'll all come home to your side. They'll vote blue no matter who. It's not like Trump's offering them anything. And when, when he's speaking more and they hear him again, they remember how disgusting and racist he is. They'll be voting for you. Don't worry about it. Yeah. I mean, the problem is that they have a really sharp contrast of, you know, Donald Trump, who, you know, people don't like the things that come out of his mouth, but one, he's been a lot less on the radar of late, partly because he's not on Twitter, partly because the liberal media has largely decided to stop covering his speeches, uh, at least with the frequency with which they did back in 2016. And also, in contrast, there are very, very, very present images of what's been going on on the ground in Gaza, which is part arguably, of what's been going on with this Twitter ban. I mean, after I did my radar yesterday, TikTok I logged... Uh, sorry, TikTok ban. I keep doing that. Not Twitter. <laughs> Not Twitter. TikTok ban. <laughs> Although, okay, you know, as I argue in my radar that you're going to hear from later today, by the same logic they're using against yeah. TikTok, I very much worry a future government would apply yeah. to Twitter. Yeah, so this is the question. And this theory, which was the subject of my radar yesterday, and which has really exploded on the internet, is that the TikTok ban really is about suppressing certain kinds of speech in the same way that we saw some of the suppressive moments over the last few years around various political ideologies. So obviously we're talking about things like the choice to uh, suppress the Hunter Biden laptop story from Twitter. Uh, we're talking about the choice to kick Trump off of Twitter around his comments leading up to January 6th. Now, whatever you think about the merits of those, I think the folks on the right very much believed, and I think we're right about the fact that they were ideologically motivated. You look at the like a complete reversal and how liberals think about Facebook. It used to be the best company in the world, a progressive bastion. Everyone wanted to work at Facebook. I went to college with Mark Zuckerberg. He was a year ahead of me. And I remember everybody wanted a Facebook job when you graduated to now where because of 2016 and Cambridge Analytica and the perception that Facebook ads and Facebook conversations contributed to Hillary Clinton's loss. Now he's persona non grata, and he regularly gets hauled before yeah. Congress to be, get grilled by both sides of the that, aisle. That is actually a point I made in, in the book I wrote about the regulation mm -hmm. of social media, Tech Panic. Um, the contrast is even more stark than, than that. You're exactly right, but between um, the, how Barack Obama used Facebook to help, you know, propel, to 
organize and campaign on Facebook. There was Barack Obama groups. Mm -hmm. um, one of the co-founders of Facebook quit the company to join the Obama campaign mm -hmm. and like work in an insidery way to mm -hmm. promote Obama on Facebook. This was all celebrated by the mainstream media as look at how tech savvy their strategy was. Then a couple years later, where when when Trump does doesn't even do nearly to that same degree level of success on Facebook, but does have some viral success. They treat it, the same people said, yep. oh, yep. It's, it was breathtaking. And the changes that Facebook made in order to, I guess, curry favor back with the, the folks that had abandoned them ended up hurting media and journalism and print journalism more than any other Politics. I mean, the, the political considerations ended up dealing a really terrible blow to a lot of smaller content creators and like less establishment politicians like Bernie Sanders, who were able to get some traction in spaces like Facebook. Um, apparently, I wasn't a part of the campaign in 2016, but there was a market difference between how much access and reach that they had back then versus what they were able to have in 2020. And when you aren't someone like, let's say, Adam Schiff, who just basically won the California primary by dint of having tens of millions of dollars on hand to get on TV in a way that other candidates weren't able to do, well, then it really shows how limiting access to alternative media sources has the greatest effect on the people with the least money and the least influence, outsider yeah. candidates, yeah. which arguably, this is, this is the argument that's being made now, is why they're being targeted and why TikTok in particular is being targeted right now when the imagery, imagery coming out of Gaza and also, um, you know, these TikToks, we're going to be talking to a Friday co-host Jessica Burbank later about a certain kind of TikTok that also goes viral on on uh, TikTok, which is this: "I do not dream of labor. Um, capitalism is a scam. Um, I can't meet the, the the metrics that prior generations met. I'm still living at home with my parents." You know, those kinds of videos also do very well. And are they a threat? to people's perception of how our country should be run in the future of capitalism. Right. And, and you know, the so social media apps are a content delivery system also, frankly, for mainstream news as well. And the fact that they, uh, to some degree, I, I feel like the mainstream media, you know, made a wish on the monkey's paw mm. for there's too much content on Facebook mm -hmm. and it's bad for our democracy and it needs to all go away. It all went away. Now yeah. there is no spread of, of, yep. of news, of you know what they would say is legitimate news. Mainstream news does not go viral on Facebook anymore because Mark Zuckerberg made a conscious choice after being yelled at yep. for years to deprioritize That's it. A great point. And as a as a direct consequence, mainstream magazines, newspapers, media organizations are laying off staff by the hundreds and thousands because they can't generate enough revenue anymore because news has been turned down since about 2019, 2020. That's a great point, Robbie. Yeah. Be careful what you wish Be for. Be careful what you wish for. And that's, uh, and that's you know, the, you know returning to the, the subject at hand right. uh, for just a minute or two. Um, so how do you think this is, do you think the uncommitted vote, so I, I began by saying, I bet his advisors are saying, don't worry about it, it doesn't mean anything. Do you think there is any private um, panic starting to set in? I, I think there is. And I think you're seeing it in the linguistic shift to now saying the word ceasefire, even though it's not the permanent ceasefire that the, the uncommitted folks have been clamoring for. Um, but it does suggest that he knows, at least rhetorically, he has to represent himself in, a, in some form that is less callous. There was also just uh, some remarks made on the Senate floor by Chuck Schumer, where he was pretty um, uh, critical of Bibi Netanyahu. And it does seem to be that there's a shift here where the administration is making the case that the excess is the worst aspects of what we're seeing uh, in Israeli policy toward Gaza, 30,000 dead, um, the recent uh, a bombing of the UNRWA food distribution center yesterday. All of these things we're going to put on Netanyahu. Netanyahu is a right wing um, despot. We want him out of there. All of that is his fault. But then does that enable the United States to maintain the same kind of relationship with Israel and basically maintain the same policies for a longer period of time just because they can keep the blame on one guy who was in a a very uh, precarious political situation himself and might be on the way out the door. Yeah. All right, we will have more rising right after this, including my radar. Can't wait to tell you what's on it. Stay tuned.